Hello everyone and welcome back to a different kind of Minecraft video here on the channel today. You see, the other day while I was polishing the Making a Boss series videos, I noticed in the Minecraft launcher that 1.19.4 had finally released, right under my nose. So like any sensible Minecrafter, I took to YouTube to see what had changed via other people's videos. After finishing a very thorough update video from Mr. Waddles himself, I noticed something. While yes, there are some content and gameplay changes, mostly dealing with parody in this update, there are also a ton of technical changes that the general Minecraft populace doesn't seem to know too much about. Or, at the very least, care very much, because when I say technical, I mean very technical. But I thought I would make a video today on some of these changes, because while you might not be a command block connoisseur yourself, I'm positive that you can make use of at least one of these technical changes, or even notice subtle differences in your world that can now be explained. Just as a preface, I'm not going to cover everything in the change list, because boy oh boy, Mojang really went to town in this update. Besides the fact that it would take me about 45 minutes just to explain all of the new changes, there are some really dense additions that even I can't wrap my head around just yet, and only really affect a very small portion of content developers. So, here are all of the most notable and game-changing technical tweaks in Minecraft 1.19.4. Let's start with the most obvious ones, or the ones that you can test in your own worlds without so much as writing a single command. For example, armor stands now preserve custom names when placed and broken. So you can see we have Domino here, and if I break that armor stand, it's still Domino. This is incredibly useful for map makers accidentally breaking armor stands or wanting to relocate them other places without needing to resummon them. Another really interesting one is the camera tilt when the player is hurt is now based on the direction of incoming damage. So you see, if I get shot from the skeleton from my right, you can see my camera actually tilt to the right. But if I move over here and get shot from the left, it actually tilts to the left. Now, while this seems like a pretty surface level technical change, there's actually a lot more behind this with some pretty cool implications. If Minecraft is now able to detect where a damage source is indicated and at the very least change the camera, perhaps in the future we could see UI elements from data pack or resource pack makers when players get shot or attacked from somewhere, a flash of red on a certain side of their screen, or or indicators to let players know where damage is coming from. I'm not super sure how Minecraft is actually calculating the directional damage right now, but I'm sure as the Minecraft community plays around with this a little bit more, it won't be long before we see some resource packs that actually show player indicators on their HUD. Now I know I'm not usually a big one for redstone, I prefer most of my contraptions in Minecraft to be command block based, but I did think this was a pretty interesting technical change that deserved at least a little peek. I'm sure, for most of you watching that are interested in anything redstone in Minecraft, you probably know the old comparator trick that if you play a music disc in Minecraft, it outputs a redstone signal with a comparator equal to one of whatever number the music disc actually is. But there's a new change that if you don't use a comparator and you actually just play any music disc, it will output a redstone signal strength of 15. You can now make specific redstone detection for when a jukebox is being played with any disc in your base. But that's not all with jukeboxes. As you can see with this very, very simple contraption here, they can now interact with hoppers and droppers. So if I go ahead and put this music disc in the trap chest, close it, it goes right through the hopper into the music disc. And then when the music disc is actually finished playing, it will output via the hopper underneath and into this other chest. Pretty neat. I wanted to add this next one just because I myself am a Minecraft map maker, and while this is a little less technical, it's incredibly helpful for map makers. If we go into the creative inventory and head over to the new functional block section and scroll down, you can see the paintings themselves have actually been listed. All of the paintings! Rather than just doing random over and over again, which you can do by clicking this random variant, you can instead take a very specific painting, and no matter where you place it, as long as there is enough room, it will always be the same painting. So no more waiting 5 to 10 minutes to try and get that perfect painting, as long as you have the space, it goes down. Of course, there are more content changes that are notable, like horse breeding, but if you want to see those, I suggest watching another video about all the very flashy stuff. Again, maybe check out Waddles. He makes very dedicated Minecraft videos that I watch whenever they come out. Okay, next up are a few technical changes handy for data pack makers. First up, if I have a complex texture in Minecraft, something like a map, an atlas, you know, etc., you can now press F3 and S, which will dump the content of dynamic textures, 
to screenshots slash debug. This is incredibly useful because now we're actually able to very easily save these dynamic textures generated by maps or other texture based things in Minecraft very quickly to a PNG in our debug folder that we can either go and edit or at least view when we need to do so. Next up, we have a way to how recipe unlocking is changed in Minecraft. Now, you know, normally when you get yourself a new item in Minecraft that you haven't picked up before in a world, you get these nice little toast pop ups that tell you new recipes and any advancements you get right there. Well, there's actually a new show notification field to recipe types that allow data pack makers to turn that off or explicitly turn that on for items that don't already have it. This is pretty useful if your data pack revolves around grinding from start to finish and you want to show way more recipes than Minecraft would traditionally allow popping up in the top right hand corner or vice versa if you're making a very hardcore pack and only want very specific milestones to show up now you can do that. Speaking of recipes and this is a little bit more technical uh, there are three new recipe types for data pack makers to make use of now including smithing underscore transform smithing underscore trim and crafting underscore decorated underscore pot. These are useful when you're making categorical recipes or you want to check if a player has done a specific type of recipe. These are just kind of upcoming in parity with 1.20. Next up, we have some very exciting changes to commands and even a couple new commands Mojang added. The first being a very well needed update to the clone command. If we pop over to the nether for just a second and ignore that gas, hello gas, you can see, oh, look at this. There's a nice little small set of table and chairs made of warped wood here in the nether. Well, let's say I didn't want to spend all the time recreating this incredible masterpiece that I've already built in the nether somewhere else in the overworld. Or, you know, more aptly, I want to take a chunk of a nether fortress and move it somewhere else. Well, now we can do that. You see, if I go ahead and open the clone command, the way it used to work is you could pick the coordinates and clone from one area to another. But now you actually get this handy from parameter. Now, if I go ahead and click on this, you can now see that we have a dimension to choose from. So if I go ahead and click the nether, which is where we're cloning from, and then paste in my coordinates and also the fact that we're moving to the overworld and the overworld coordinates that I want to clone to, and I'll just do replace force, now we can actually clone things from other dimensions to new target dimensions. So if I go back into the overworld here and look right next to our nether portal, sure enough, there it is, this fancy little table and chairs all the way from the nether to another dimension. Now here's where things start to get exciting. We have a brand new command in Minecraft 1.19.4 that is going to help data pack and map makers so much. I can already see myself using this in future boss tutorials and enemy encounters. That new command is the slash damage command. Now, right off the front, especially if you're just a normal vanilla Minecraft player, you don't mess around with commands too much, you might be thinking this is a command that allows you to damage players or other entities. And you'd be exactly right. That is what Mojang has slapped on the team. However, there is a lot more depth to this that actually allows us to define sources of the damage, which can really change up how maps can handle entities interacting with other entities. For example, we can start with the damage command and say, all right, I'm going to damage myself. And then it wants to know how much. So I'll just do a value of six or three hearts. And then it's going to ask for a damage type. Now, this is really interesting because even though this is from a command, I can have the game think I'm taking damage from... I don't know, let's say a falling anvil. But that's not all, because now if I click buy, we can also see that we can choose another entity that is dealing this falling anvil damage to myself. So what this lets us choose is actually what is dealing the specific damage, even though we said this is technically falling anvil damage, which the game might calculate differently than projectile damage we can actually say this damage is coming from any source. For example, we could say that this damage is actually coming from an entity of type, let's say, potion. And of course, because we're doing a type, we have to limit equals one. And what this is technically saying is there was a thrown potion at some point that has done falling anvil damage to us. But that's not all. You can even take this a step further and say, but it came from, and then who threw that potion? And in this case, maybe it was just myself. Now, what are the actual implications of this very long string of command that I've just written out? Well, this allows you to really make custom attacks for entities that are no longer defined by default damage sources in Minecraft. For example, think about making a skeleton boss that you don't want to fire arrows. Instead of being subjected to only dealing projectile damage when you're fighting that skeleton, you could instead have another command block summoning potions around the player that the skeleton spawns. But now you can actually say 
that this player has taken a specific type of damage from a specific entity that you can name and limit whatever you want and even say that the entity that has thrown this potion is your boss or another player or anything like that. And this allows the game to calculate things in very hilarious ways. Of course, if you didn't want to deal with all the entity mumbo jumbo, you could also just do at and then the coordinates that you want the damage to originate from. Now, if I just go ahead and press enter like this, you can see I do actually take six falling anvil damage to myself at these coordinates. Now, the coordinates don't super matter. They only matter if you are referencing them later in data commands. Just for the average player, if I do this over and over again, you can actually see that I was squashed to death by a falling anvil. Incredible, Mojang. Another hugely impactful command, especially for people like me, is they've now changed the effect command. Now, before, when you tried to give an effect to a player, you had to, you know, give a duration, which would, of course, show up in the player's inventory. And if you wanted it to be infinite, then you needed to type in, you know, 999999. However, now you can just type the string infinite. And if you do that, you don't ever have to worry. You actually get this cool little infinity symbol that shows up as well. So no longer worry about, you know, duration running out or trying to remember the numbers that you have to type in. You can just write infinite now and the effects will stay forever, well, until you die. All right, to get a little deeper in the nitty gritty, we also have some changes to the execute command, which is, in my opinion, the most versatile command in Minecraft already. And these changes actually go into the execute if or execute unless, which are kind of opposite, but also the same thing. The new condition, which you'll notice right here, is called loaded. If I go ahead and click this and then supply a set of coordinates like, I don't know, 0, 64, 0, this command, whatever we decide to run, will only run if these coordinates are considered loaded in the world. And now the definition for loaded is whether or not it's spawn on a multiplayer server or there's players within a certain chunk radius and, and things like that. But this could be super useful for only executing commands on a server if players are currently in a loaded chunk or vice versa, if you change to unless, it will do the exact opposite. Now there is one more condition that they've added here, and that is dimension, which does largely a similar thing to the clone, where you can now execute if or unless a certain dimension is where the executing command can take place. For example, that you can then check if a random player is actually in the overworld. Now we're not quite done with the execute command just yet because they've also added another parameter called execute on. Now this is also incredibly useful because this executes on a relation to the executor. So if we take a step back for a second, and this is going to be weird, but I'm going to grab myself a boat. Oh, let's grab the dark oak boat. Oh, you look nice. If I go ahead and ride the dark oak boat, this now considers my dark oak boat the vehicle and me the rider. So if I do execute as, and then we'll do myself or at P, we can then add the on condition to say, oh, look at all of these things that deal with different aspects of at P or myself, my attacker, my leisure, my origin, my passengers, or in this case, my vehicle. And then we can just run whatever command we want. Honestly, each one of these conditions on their own even has a big definition, so if you want, maybe I'll make another video on just the updated features to the execute command itself, because I feel like I could talk for at least 15 minutes on this on its own. Speaking of which, one more major change, although this one is even more technical than the last, we have the new execute subcommand for execute positioned over. Now, we've actually used positioned as itself in a couple of our command videos before, which allows you to choose exactly where the command is originating from. However, with the new over condition, we can actually execute over height maps. Now, height maps in games are actually a way to determine topography of a world or level, and Minecraft has added these new criteria called height maps, which basically indicate four different locations. First is we can position it over a motion blocking material. For example, anything that blocks the player's motion. So this would actually exclude things like tall grass or flowers or things like that. World surface is any non-air block. Ocean floor is any non-fluid motion blocking material. So all the way down to the ocean, this, this gets through water. And then finally, any motion blocking no leaves. So if you wanted to execute something underneath a tree, but you were using the height map, this could get you through the leaves. This is really interesting, and I want to play around with this a little bit more to see the full functionality of how we can use height maps to execute commands. Did you think we were done with the execute? Because we're not quite yet. The last one that they've added to the execute is just a really good shorthand. You can now use execute summon. Now what this does is this is the exact same as the slash summon command. However, 
because we're putting it in an execute, this now determines that whatever we summon here is automatically our at s. So no longer do we have to do, all right, let's do execute as, you know, at e type equals blaze, you know, and, and looking for that. Instead, if we just put it in the same command and we do, all right, we're going to summon a blaze, and that's exactly who we're executing as. So then we can do tp, oh, sorry, run tp at s and it's already calculated as the blaze because that's who we're executing it on and then we can just teleport the blaze you know wherever we want goodbye blaze all right just a very quick update to the title command as well if you do slash title at p and then you go down to times before you had to enter a number specifically in seconds but now the title times actually works with the t s and d suffixes for example, if I put two here, I can change this to be two days, two seconds, or two ticks. This is actually also changed with the weather command. So if I do weather clear and then do 300, I can now also do 300 days, 300 seconds, or 300 ticks. Also to note, if I don't specify this number for weather here, how Minecraft was calculating this before is it would, you know, change your weather to an unspecified duration. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you've ever changed the weather to clear or to rainy, it might actually snap back within like the next 10 to 20 seconds sometimes. Now, however, if you don't give it a duration, it actually just loops into the normal Minecraft weather cycle. So you shouldn't have any more abnormal immediate rainstorms or thunderstorms or clear skies or anything like that. It should be back to your normal Minecraft weather. All right, time for another new versatile command. Next up, we have the slash ride command. Now, again, if you're just playing Minecraft and you're not hugely into the development of commands, you can probably guess what this one is going to do, and you would be exactly right. First things first, we need to provide a target, or who is actually going to mount our vehicle. So I will just put at P or myself. And then we want to say we're going to mount, and then we're going to look for any entity we want. In this case, we can do type equals pig, limit equals one, sort by, and then we can do nearest. Just like that. Now, if I press enter, you can actually see that I get warped to the nearest pig, and I am now riding the pig without a saddle. Uh, of course, I can't actually control the pig, but uh, you do actually see the pig hearts. Wow. I don't know if I've ever noticed that before. Actually, hold on. Can I, can I control the pig with a carrot without a saddle? Hello? No. <laughs> no, you definitely can't. Now, there are a couple situations where this command will fail, and I'll just go over them very quickly. You can't have players ride other players. That doesn't work, unfortunately. You can't make totem poles, so if I'm already riding a pig, I then can't automatically ride another entity as well. That will fail. You can't ride yourself. And if the pig was already riding another entity, I can't then warp myself on top of that pig. So, no totem poles as of yet. Sag. For this next one, we're actually going to go over to the changelog here because this is actually a rather hard thing to showcase, but is also incredibly important. They've added a new damage types creation for data pack makers. Basically, long story short, is this allows data pack makers to make their own damage types within their data packs. This is insane. The implications are are huge. You can set all sorts of crazy stuff for your individual damage types, for example, if it causes hunger exhaustion, whether or not the actual difficulty level of the game scales your damage, custom death messages for when being killed by your new damage type, and if you even want special death variants. Also the sound effects as well. This is crazy. I imagine in the not too distant future we will see custom maps and mini games making huge use of this effect without the need of plugins. Now imagine combining this with the slash damage command that we ran into earlier. You could do something like in a command block, execute whenever a slime is near, you know, within like, let's say 0 0.02 blocks of a player, you're going to deal damage with the new damage command to that player. However, now you can deal damage of the type of a new type, we could call it slime damage. And if you're killed by slime damage, which deals, you know, 0.7 points of exhaustion to you, it will say, oh, you've been slimed to death. So now not only do you have custom sources of damage and custom damage types, but by combining them, you can truly give entities custom ways to kill and hurt other entities. All right, moving right along, we actually also have some new game rules in this update. Primarily, the biggest being command modification block limit. Have you ever tried to be cloning, filling, or fill bioming before, and you get that error message saying, oh, this is too many blocks, you can't actually clone this? Well, now you can actually increase the limit. 
So instead of that arbitrary, like, 342,000 or whatever it was before, you can now go up to 999,999,999 blocks. Although, I would be careful of doing this if your computer already can't handle render distance of more than 10. And now, for quite possibly the biggest technical addition to Minecraft in, well, entire Minecraft history, if I come and look back at where we just were... <laughs> That's right, we actually have display entities in vanilla Minecraft. So right off the bat, you might be thinking, what the heck is this? Why is there just a thin, slightly opaque box with text in it just in the middle of the world? Well, in 1.19.4, Mojang has actually added display entities into the game. So, there are three new display entities in total. The first one being a text box, which is very customizable, allows you to do all sorts of things that you can normally do with text in Minecraft, such as coloring it, changing things like bold and italic. You can also change the bounding box around it to see how much is called, how big the actual text box is. But beyond just having floating text in your world, you can also have floating items. The next one is called the item display. This one is also super versatile because for the first time, you can actually just have rendered items in Minecraft just in the world. You can also scale them to be bigger or smaller, and again, there's a whole bunch of customization options with these as well. And finally, which might be my favorite, there's also a block display, which is this right here, which is a fully rendered block in Minecraft. Now, it should be noted as I just passed through it. All of these entities, similarly to the marker, don't tick at all, and they have no collisions or physics, which means you can have as many of these on your server as you want, and besides texture and graphical rendering, they won't take up any tick space. But here's the weird part. Because they're entities, they can still be affected by entity commands. For example, this item display right here, you can actually see as I sort of rotate, I get this cool little billboard effect, which I'll go over in just a second. I could actually teleport this item around. I could teleport it over here, I could teleport it over there. Anything that affects an entity like teleport commands or other commands as well, you can enact on these entities. So you'll notice that both the item and the block display are actually moving as I move, and that's because I turned on the horizontal billboard, which is something you can also do for the text box as well. But just to show you guys, if you move around, you actually get these interesting thing where the uh, the Y value is always trying to face you sort of straight on. You can also do this with the X value as well. I just thought this looked amazing. Like, look at this with the floating Minecraft barrel that you can pass through that just sort of moves around. I mean, what year are we in? Honestly, these entities deserve a video on their own. So let me know in the comments below if that's something you want to see explored deeper. Next up, we also have a few secret tags that have been added in this update, which actually could mean a lot for the future of the game and biomes as we know them. The first tag is the increased fire burnout tag, which can be applied to biomes, so data pack makers take notes. As far as it is described, this new biome tag allows fires to burn longer or shorter in different biomes depending on if this tag is present. Or, I guess, whatever the value of the tag may be. Now, after doing some testing, I couldn't see if this was actually already present in the vanilla game or if it was just going to be new biomes, but science would say that it should actually burn a little bit longer in arid biomes and a little bit shorter in wet biomes, which... Well, it doesn't seem the case right now. Similarly, there's actually an interesting change with the Snow Golem with the new Snow Golem Melts Biome tag. Again, this is actually going to control which biomes the Snow Golem can or cannot melt inside of. Again, I couldn't actually find if this was changed in any vanilla parameters already, but this does mean in both scenarios, data pack makers making new biomes can actually determine if both Snow Golems and Fire are applicable and how long they burn and or die for. Which is actually really cool, because that could mean custom biomes in the future have their own damage types, their own survival ability, all sorts of new parameters that Mojang is baking into the vanilla game. I didn't see this one getting talked about anywhere, so I wanted to make sure I included it on this list. Finally, although this one is technically going to affect Minecraft 1.20 and not quite Minecraft 1.19.4, it was included in this version and the implications are huge, and that is how armor trims are going to be handled by servers in the future. You see, according to the 1.19.4 patch notes, trim patterns in materials for armor are going to be defined by the server through the trim underscore pattern and trim underscore material registry, respectively. As a result, new trim patterns and materials can be added via data packs. Now, I think we were all expecting when these trim patterns were first added that 
resource pack makers could go nuts and change these armor trims to be all sorts of wacky visuals, PNGs, and memes that you could slap onto your armor. But this... This is so much more. What this is implying is that data pack makers will be able to increase the registry of materials and patterns on a vanilla Minecraft server. So in addition to the base armor trims that you have, you can add more. Like, a lot more. The patch notes then go on to say that these are then synchronized to clients when they join the server. So the only thing you're ever going to need to see all of these fancy trims is an accompanying resource pack to go along with that data pack. And then the server will just send out the registry, making everything work for you. It's it's kind of like a bridge between the graphics that you see and actually the mechanics that you interact with in the game. Imagine getting a custom recipe on a server, crafting it in here and putting, I don't know, let's say maybe a, a cookie on a, a piece of iron armor. And then not only can you actually craft it, when you wear that piece of iron armor, it will actually show up as a cookie. Mojang might have just made the most customizable feature in all of Minecraft. Anyway, that's just going to about do it for today's video. That is all of the technical stuff that I could find in the patch notes of 1.19.4 that I thought was noteworthy and deserved a mention inside of a video. Of course, I couldn't cover everything, so if there are a couple of other features that you guys want to see covered in a video like this, please let me know down below in the comments and maybe we'll make a part two. As for some of the more complex commands, I imagine it's going to take some people a little bit of time to get used to some of the syntax and stuff, so I'm sure I'll have some more of my own videos out in the future on how some more of the data entity and, and that kind of stuff works. But hey, if you're itching for more Minecraft stuff, did you know we have a creating your very own boss in vanilla Minecraft tutorial going on right now? Episodes are coming out every Tuesday on the Mudkip Ninja channel, but if you want to see them a little bit earlier as well as some premium behind the scenes content, then consider supporting me on Patreon. All Kips level 2 and above have a chance to see those videos a day early, and all Kips level 3 and above have a chance to see extra behind the scenes videos of making the arena and bonus features to the boss. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this slightly different style of video where we look at some new technical features to Minecraft. If you want to see more, please do let me know. And until next time, guys, see you.